Without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest today. Peter M. Brown is the director of Rocky Mountain Tree Ring Research, which he founded in 1997. His research involves use of tree ring and other data to reconstruct fire, forest, and climate histories very relevant, and his application to forest and fire management and restoration ecology. He received BS and MS degrees from the University of Arizona and a PhD in forest sciences from Colorado State University, where he's also an affiliate faculty member. Tom Martin and his wife, Hazel Clark, own Vishnu Temple Press in Flagstaff. He volunteers for the nonprofit River Runners for Wilderness and the Grand Canyon Historical Society. With an MS in Physical Therapy, he has authored award-winning river-related books on the Colorado Plateau in Grand Canyon and walked the entire length of the Grand Canyon, Lee's Ferry to Pierce Ferry. He has also recorded well over 300 oral history interviews of people who have a historical connection to the Grand Canyon region. And just a reminder, um, if you are not our presenter, please mute yourself until the end when we will be doing a Q&A. Thank you so much. And Peter and Tom, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you all can take it away. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. He's on the go, Pete, go. On his <laughs> Let me get that. This is cool. Everyone can see that okay? Yes. So go ahead, Tom. You were going to start off? Oh, oh I was going to go. All right. Okay. Um, you know, I want to thank Shannon and Nikki Lober and Kathy Freda and, and uh, just this great crew of people at the Reardon Mansion. Pete, next slide, please. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real honor to be able to uh, do a fundraiser. Um, this new Temple Press encourage you to go over to the website for the next seven days. 40% um, proceeds, all, all sales are going to the uh, mansion. Next, Pete. Got a ton of books here on all kinds of stuff. Some, some new books that have come out. John Fuller's written on the Verde River and the Gila River. Um, these are kind of river guides, but they're also just, just full of amazing river history. So that's a lot of fun. Next, please, Pete. They're, they're excellent books. I read both of them now. Come on, next slide. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> oh, just all kinds of books on all kinds of stuff, not just rivers um, and, and crazy river adventures, though we do like rivers. Next slide. Oh, sorry. I, I, I cut it down, Tom. I'm sorry. I, I did that. Where did that slide go? <laughs> so before we talk about a little tule raft in the Grand Canyon, we need to look at what we know in quotes about river running. And that starts through Grand Canyon in 1869 with the first documented river trip through Grand Canyon. Next, please. And I, I, this history of river running is, is just amazing. This is the earliest photo I could find of women uh, piloting a boat uh, anywhere near the Grand Canyon. This is 1923. That's uh, Edith Kolb and, and her friend, Kathy Fall. Uh, in the USGS boats there in 1923. Next picture. Of course, today, um, we, we do a lot of rubber raft uh, river work in the canyon, and that all started in 1938 when the first documented rubber boat went through the canyon, piloted by Amos Berg. Next shot. Of course, the boats have gotten bigger, and when they're motorized, you can get them up at a high rate of speed, and you can hit obstacles made of water and uh, do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, next picture, please. Another option with these is uh, next shot. A little much smaller boats, um, but uh, very, very popular is river running throughout uh, the United States, and uh, Grand Canyon is no exception. Next photo. So while the person on the right of your screen likes to think they know everything about river running and the history of river running, the smart person on the left 
expresses a visual presentation of doubt. And with that in mind, we begin the question, who was the first through Grand Canyon? Next picture, please. Oh, I, if um, you're I, interested. I forgot I threw this one in, in, in just the last minute, but just uh, Tom has this whole, if, you, if anyone is interested in these, in the historic boats, uh, this is the uh, uh, boat corral there at the Grand Canyon. And Tom has a whole series of really excellent videos, including one on this Thule Reed boat as well, so. I forgot about this slide. I was kind of like, what do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Oh yeah, that's over at, uh, if you search Tom Martin Grand Canyon on Vimeo, you'll find all those little videos we put together on all these historic boats that are behind me here in the boat shop at the South Rim of Grand Canyon. So Thule, what do we know about Thule and why do we want to know about it? The people on Makav and the Kokopa and the Mojave and the Gila Indians all had Thule reed boats as documented first by the Spaniards in 1540. They called the Colorado River El Rio de las Balsas, the river of little boats. Hmm. Okay, next picture. So if there's anybody watching this presentation that knows about stand-up paddle boards, you need to know these things have been around a long, long time. And if you paddle a little inflatable kayak, you need to know these things have been around a long, long time. Like we're talking, oh, five, 600 years at least into the thousands of years. So this is nothing new. Next picture, please. I wanna mention the Whipple crossing of the Colorado, the ice expedition. It was so friggin' cold in the winter of 1853-54. The artist who made this picture here was Bobby Mulhausen, who had a wonderful sense of humor, I'm gonna read this here, that described the terrible time they had getting across the Colorado River in his very awkward boat here, which at one point tipped over completely and their supplies dumped in the river. Now you're like, well, what does this have to do with Thule watercraft? Well, the Mojave, who had their flexible raft, they could steer, went round and round and picked up all the supplies. And it was his conclusion that they should have hired the Mojaves in the first place to get across the river, which a lot of people did. Next slide. So these, these, these Thule boats are still plying the waters of, of the Pacific coast today, all the way from Peru up to San Francisco. Indigenous peoples are still making these incredible watercraft. So with that as a backstory, next picture. I got this email back in March of 2019 that said, you have won a Grand Canyon launch date. And I fell out of my chair. And I scurried back and I said, okay, got to do something and started planning and bringing people in to go on this river trip. Next picture. Those of you that don't know where the Grand Canyon is, you need to think about the far northern boundary of Arizona up against Utah, wedged between two giant reservoirs. To the northeast is Lake Powell, the reservoir behind Glen Canyon Dam, and to the southwest is Lake Mead, the reservoir formed by Hoover Dam. Between those two is the Grand Canyon. So that's where we are, 177 miles uh, of, of actual canyon. Pete, you're on. And next, next picture. So I've got this permit and I'm doing some research and I run across this letter in my research that says up in Nankawi, a very special ruin that he had been told about is supposed to contain a boat made of some kind of rushes. Well, who wrote that letter? That letter was written in 1958 by a guy named Harvey Butcher, a Grand Canyon hiker. And he was writing it to a fellow named Otis Marston. And Marston had said, Harvey, 
there's a guy I want you to interview who's the long of tooth, an old man in 1958 in Flagstaff about the Grand Canyon. Go interview him and see what he says. And this is what the old man said. Was there was this very special ruin with a boat in it made of some kind of rushes. And I was like, hey, I got a permit. If I could get the rushes and I could make a boat, what would happen? Next picture. So I got my hard suffering wife into the pickup truck and we drove down to Yuma. I didn't go to Yuma, we went to Blythe actually. Got in touch with the BLM, they said, yeah, you can harvest this stuff in between these months of the year. And I said, okay, great, fine. This stuff is really tall, it's about 12 feet tall. Next picture. It's hot down there, it was really hot and Blythe. I'm crawling around on my hands and knees in this muddy water with a very sharp knife. It was not a good idea. This stuff is about the diameter of your thumb and it's 12 feet tall. And it has these, these little cells in it which push air down into the roots. So the plant can be waterlogged in the roots and not die. And that's what makes this stuff buoyant. And I didn't know any of this stuff. Pete was the guy who figured all this stuff out. Next picture, please. So we dragged this stuff home on the top of the pickup truck with people looking at us as we drove down the highway like we were crazy. And we put it in the back of the house on, a, on a, just a tarp and let it start drying out in the sun. And after a couple weeks, next picture, a friend of ours named Stacy came up from Prescott and Hazel and I started bundling this stuff up with, with a real small diameter nylon rope you can see there in the photo. We just wrapped never ending bundles of little bits of nylon around this stuff, next picture. And eventually, voila, it looked like this. What we didn't know, now listen, we're pretty stupid in this and the indigenous peoples of America made these beautiful boats and still make these beautiful boats. We made a glorified whisk broom. Okay, I, I, this, is, this is a very poor reproduction of what the indigenous peoples can make, just really beautiful watercraft. What we didn't know was that we should have found a curved piece of wood to go in the nose of the boat to help the nose stay up. I didn't know that. That's a lot of things we don't know. I still don't, but next slide. So Pete wanted to put in the little picture of the book that I wrote, but what I wanted to say is people ask me, you built that little Thule boat. Why didn't you row it yourself through the Grand Canyon? Were you chicken? My answer is yes, I was chicken, but I also had this boat that I had built and I'm like, well, I'm gonna take my little gem boat. I need somebody who wants to row the Thule boat. Next picture. Well, I just had to throw the, uh, if, if anyone is interested in the story of that uh, dory right there that Tom built, that's in this big water little boat. So it's a really good story. So, um, and again, buy it and it go the, the you know funds go to the uh, Reardon mansion so that's right this is a fundraiser i forgot so who's going to paddle this thing through grand canyon well i thought of my friend pete pete and i went to high school together we met back in the day in the last century before most of you were born and 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 pete has always been dedicated to adventure he's interested in in archeology span and paleontology and how the world works. And I asked him about it and he was he was 100% bought into this right from day one. Just, just wonderful. Next picture. Well, Tom, you never told me you were scared about it. I just thought it was, you know, since you had your boat, it was gonna, you know, that's why you weren't right. Oh, true confessions. <laughs> So we pulled together uh, an amazing crew of people to come on this journey. And this was at the height of COVID, um, which we haven't cleared still. And um, so we, we brought tests on this trip to test ourselves after a number of days. 
to make sure we could drop COVID protocol. It was a big deal, but this is an amazing crew of people. And if you're gonna take a Thule boat through Grand Canyon, you need an amazing group of people. Yeah. Next picture. So these trips all start at Lee's Ferry. And, and while we all scurried around and put our boats together, Pete was patiently making last minute touch-ups here and there to the little raft, which included, next picture, uh, one of the things we did learn that the indigenous peoples uh, do with these boats is they put uh, willow shafts through the tule to strengthen it. So we did that with a hammer and some three quarter inch dowels from home despot and, uh, and put that together like that. Peter was off doing that. And I'm dinking around with my little dory and helping people get stuff loaded on boats. And the next thing I do, I look up and what do I see? I see this. Well, okay. Take so, it away. Yeah. So um, basically, you know, once I had the, we had the boats rigged and, and, and I helped on all the other boats as well, but because, um, because the plan was that this thing was going to fall apart in about, you know, day three or two or four or whatever. And then I was going to help row one of the other boats, uh, Hazel's boat, actually, Tom's wife. And um, so anyway, but, you know, of course we had, that was the first question on this thing. Was it even going to float? So immediately I had to get it out there on the water at, at, uh, at Lee's Ferry and, and paddle it around. And sure enough, it paddled just fine. It floated, it moved. It was real easy to, to get out there in the water. Luckily, uh, and this was another question, our second big question. First question was going to float. Second question was, can we get it past the river ranger who approves all the, the river gear that you take down, you know, uh, the PFDs, the uh, uh, first aid kits and so on. And so she also has to approve obviously all of the watercraft. And so that was a big question. Is she gonna approve our watercraft? And luckily she did. And a lot of it was us paddling around right there at Lee's Ferry, so. Um, just to mention, we did have a safety kayaker, uh, Fiona Gormley. Uh, she was great to have along because it it was you know it was an experiment. So to make sure that we had uh, some some backup here if if something did go wrong. A couple of notes. So I, I've just got a, a bunch of slides here of some of the trip as we went down the river. Uh, one note that we it was pretty important was we hauled it out of the water every night just to let it drain. That was a uh, one of the main concerns we were going to have with it was it going to get waterlogged and, and just too heavy to actually move through the water uh, sink at some point. And it was certainly hauling it out of the water helped a lot. It, uh, it would take like four of us to haul it out in the evening, uh, you know, every afternoon when we got to camp. But then the next morning, usually I could could lay it down and uh, bring it back to the water by myself. So it did drain quite a bit. Plus, the nice thing about this boat was it smelled good the entire way. It still smelled like Thule reed, uh, Thule grass. Rubber boat doesn't do that. Uh, one other uh, modification we did. Uh, so Tom mentioned the dowels. But uh, the only other modification we did on the whole thing was that uh, the, after the first day or two, I was making a quite a dent in the middle uh, bundle where I was sitting. So we found this piece of driftwood um, uh, and strapped that on. And that helped a lot because that distributed the weight a little bit more. And then you notice probably in those first couple of photos that I did have a, a little blow up seat. Now, obviously the, uh, you know, Kokopa and Mojave, historically they would either stand up, which no way in the world I had the balance to do that. Um, or kneel, which I thought, eh, that's going to kill my knees after a few days. And the seat was just absolutely perfect. Uh, the way I learned to go through the rapids was actually to just drop my legs on either side and ride like a horse, basically. And then it, it gave a lot of balance to be able to, to really, um, you know, go through the waves that way. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, every night, uh, this is actually after probably two or three weeks in the water, but you can see, you know, there's the arenchyma, the openings, the cells in there. And again, it, it, uh, it would drain every night and it would uh, be pretty buoyant. Uh, it stayed pretty buoyant the entire trip. Um, 
If you've never been down through the Grand Canyon and on a raft trip, uh, any of you just, if you ever get the chance, go. It's just an incredible experience, just phenomenal. So here I am. Uh, next question we had was, could it keep up with the boats? No problem at all. It tracked very well. It went through the water just extremely well. Uh, we just had a grand time. And you know, this is the inner gorge, uh, just beautiful country, of course. We finally made it to, um, you know, there was a huge question as to, you know, after the second day, I, I was convinced it was going to make it. Um, the second day I went through House Rock Rapid, which is really one of the first big rapids, and fell off the boat, uh, got smacked by a couple of giant waves down at the bottom of the rapid, and um, the boat held together. I held onto the boat. I held together. Uh, I thought at one point I lost my helmet. I was wearing a, a helmet, but the wave hit me so hard. Uh, but it stayed. And after that, I knew it was going to make it. I, I, had a, I was convinced. So here we are at Phantom Ranch. Um, Tom had to go up and, and contact the ranger and come down and get a photo of it just to show everybody that we made it that far. Uh, which, by the way, the other thing is, that, you know, uh, there's the, the Bright Angel Ruin that's right there. And, and the one thing I like to look at on this is, well, geez, there's that river right there. How do you get across the river when the river's high? You, you just stay on one side of the river all the time, or you have a Thule boat that you could get across the river. So just a few more. Oh, and then side hikes, of course. I just threw this one in as pretty side hike. Side hikes, of course, are the, you know, the essence of a Grand Canyon River trip having layover days, you know, where we stay in a camp one night, uh, two nights, and then we can uh, do a, a longer day hike. Uh, this is Bass Camp. I mean, just gorgeous spots. Again, go if you ever get a chance. Uh, of course, the major question on the Thule Wrap, you know, the Grand Canyon is famous for its whitewater. So can it survive the rapids. This is actually Hans Rapid, the one of the first big ones going down the inner gorge. And um, I'm completely out of position on this one. I should be way over to the left on that other tongue over there where the safety kayaker, the caption on this one is, Fiona's telling me, you're on your own on this one, bud. So, um, but I fell off. I, I, I rode down for a ways, fell off, climbed back on. That was the other thing is I held on to the, to the raft every time. Uh, was able to climb back onto it, usually by the tail waves. Um, it, you know, with the PFD and a, a dry suit on. Now, just historically, if someone was doing this, you know, the can the river was known to be very silty, very warm. Right now, of course, it comes out of the bottom of Glen Canyon Dam, so it's it tends to be, you know, pretty chilly, particularly in the winter time. But uh, even all year round, it would have been fairly warm, warmer than it is now. Uh, just a couple, a few more uh, rapid shots. This is upset rapid. Uh, Hazel going through. Uh, here's me going through. Um, I ran every rapid, ran every mile. Uh, lava, lava rapid, of course, is the is the big one. This is actually a kayaker who went through just before us, and you can see that giant wave in the back uh, background over there. Well, just to show you, here's a here's a little video. This is my only video clip. Now you can. Uh, search, uh, if, if you uh, go to YouTube and just search on uh, Thule Reed Grand Canyon, you'll find a few more videos that I took. But uh, just to give you an idea of what it's, it's like from the seat of this thing. Um, and of course, as, as, as every rower knows, it's getting in the right position at the right time that's the key to getting into some of these rapids. But lava is a pretty, pretty scary one at times. But uh, it was a blast, and I almost made it all the way through. But as you can see, that wave right there gets me. So knocks me off. I'm still holding on to the raft. Uh, I can climb back on. Another big wave gets me another one. But uh, And at this point, the, the camera gets a little bit bent over. I'll, I'll, I'll go on from this. Oh, oh, geez, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, where am I? Excuse me. So anyway, 
um, just continuing on down the river. We, we, you know, it was a great time, 30 days all, all, the, all together on the water. Uh, not always every day on the water, obviously. We had a lot of layover days. Uh, had some fantastic weather, sunny days most days, but we did have some snow and some rainy days towards the end of the trip. Um, this is actually uh, just right near the very end of the canyon, uh, just past Columbine Falls. We stopped and took a hike up to Columbine Falls, and uh, Tom took this one just as I was leaving the, the beach there. But I just uh, throw, throw this in. So this is at mile 275 or so uh, from Lee's Ferry. And, uh, you know, 29 days, this is just the, the day before we, we uh, got off the river. And notice how, the, you know, the raft is beat up there. It's uh, where I was sitting, the, my, particularly my feet had rubbed through the, uh, the bundles some. Uh, the, the bow notice has uh, really declined, but Notice how high I'm floating relative to when we launched at Lee's Ferry. This is the first day. So that raft is incredibly robust. It survived 30 days, 280 miles in the Grand Canyon and uh, did just fine. So in terms of an experiment that this could have been done ever historically, I think we suggest that it very well could. And the implications are that it, you know, is entirely possible that someone prehistorically could have done it. Some made it. Uh, just a few points about that. So, you know, now we start looking and there are both the Navajo and the Hopi have legends about river running uh, before Powell. And so, for example, the, the Hopi legend of Tio is probably pretty well known. This is actually um, in the Hope, uh, Desert View Tower, the Hopi room, the first floor of the Desert View Tower, you know, there in the Eastern Canyon. And uh, check this out, but up in the right-hand corner there, that's actually the raft that Tio actually made, supposedly from a, uh, a log, a hollow log that he sealed up the ends with pinion pits, cut a hatch into it, and then uh, ran through the Grand Canyon. He was uh, just curious about where it went, supposedly, and, and uh, ended up at the, uh, in the Sea of Cortez, basically, in salt water, uh, according to the legend. Uh, he also founded the Snake Clan. So all of this is sort of Tio's uh, adventures uh, uh, in the legends of, uh, of him. But, but again, you see the Grand Canyon there and the raft going through. Uh, the problem with a log raft, of course, is that once a log raft gets stuck in an eddy, which it's going to do fairly quickly in the Grand Canyon, it's just going to go around in circles. Uh, just to let you know, I did, the only time I lost the raft um, ever was I, I fell off in an eddy and, and the raft went one direction, I went the other direction. Uh, Tom was there in the gym and tried to help me corral it. And what I did was just swim to the shore wait for the raft to come back around in the eddy, just circling back around, jumped out, climbed on, and away I went. So, um, and Tom says, I, I should have waited for Tom to get out, but I left him there by himself, so. But anyway, you need some way of propulsion, and that's where a Thule raft, that technology could have been traded far and wide, up and down the canyon, uh, up and down the Colorado River Basin. Thule grows all over the Colorado River Basin, so the, the technology, the material, is there. Uh, also, the other thing that we've just been starting to explore are, are rock art possibilities. I don't, you know, the one on the left there, could that be a boat? You know, it's, 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 it's not level, but, but the one on the right, Tom found recently, and I just love that one. It looks to me like a, going through Hans Rapid on a Thule Reed raft. Uh, and, and dropping your legs down on either side, exactly like what I was doing. That could have been me right there. So, um, so anyway, you know, is there evidence that we've been kind of overlooking of some of the, you know, boating technology uh, uh, that might've been out there uh, in, in the past in the archeological records? Uh, this, uh, actually found this one uh, recently. This is, so there's Tio's boat on the right there again. Uh, from the, the uh, Hopi, from uh, Desert View Tower. And uh, just some examples of what, you know, uh, this one author thought might be uh, rock art, bo boats and rock art. 
And then finally, this is my last slide. Just again, as Tom mentioned, uh, you know, part of a trip like this, of course, is having excellent company. We had the, the best on this trip. And, you know, if you're going to be in the Grand Canyon for 30 days, it's awfully nice to have some really nice company and, of course, great support for a Thule Reed experiment, boat experiment, and, uh, and, and just, just going through life down in the Grand Canyon. So thanks again, Tom, for the, for the, for the uh, invitation on the, on the trip and the experiment. So. Well, thank you, That's all for your, thank you for your willingness to uh, run the experiment. And, 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 and again, I just kind of want to reiterate um, what, what, what Pete's saying is um, all we did was prove concept. There's much more work that needs to be done on this, and 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 that's all we've got. Uh, is is just a is just a first attempt. Could it could it have really happened before European contact? Absolutely. Um, again, as Pete mentioned, in the fall, um, water temperatures were high, uh, seventy degrees or higher. And uh, indigenous peoples knew how to swim. They knew how to fish. Um, it, why would you leave food and water? And if you stayed in food and water and you knew how to build a boat, why wouldn't you build one? Now, these are simple questions. Um, so I, 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 I think we, we have a lot to learn from the indigenous cultures and their explorations of the Southwest, and certainly the Southwest canyons. Yeah, so I, we, I, you know, it just, History doesn't begin in 1869. There's got to have been, you know, uh, people living along the river throughout the Colorado River Basin, all the rivers, you know, San Juan, so on. Um, those would have been barriers to travel uh, at any time, you know, at most of the year. Yeah, sometimes you could probably wade across the Colorado River, but um, you know, other times there would have been some, some you know, yeah, there might have been a log right there, but geez, if this technology was available and the material was available, how much was it used and we just have not recognized in the archaeological record? That's right. Um, Becca asked a really good question. And if you have questions, um, a question for Shannon, whether we should just let people unmute now, um, there's not a lot of people in the group, um, but Becca put up a little chat question. You can certainly put your questions in chat. Um, she, want, she asked, where is uh, Lots of Knots now? Um, we, we did title the boat. We gave it a name called Lots of Knots. And if you say that quickly, it's Lots of Nuts. I mean, you guys are really crazy. Um, uh, the boat was scooped up uh, and taken to the John Wesley Powell Museum in Page, Arizona. Not the one in Green River. Don't get confused here. Um, and uh, so that's where it went. Oh, cool. So there's Nicole Lack. Hello, Nicole. How are you? So did anyone that joined you on your group, did they get it? Are they inspired to recreate the journey, perhaps on another southwestern river? It's a good question, Tom. Maybe you should do the San Juan next. Or... Not, not yet that I know of, but, you know, Hazel and I ran the San Juan earlier this year, and, and I was looking. I was like, wow, this would be easy. It would be very easy in a in a little Thule boat. It hasn't been done yet, but doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and I would like to see more more Thule watercraft in Grand Canyon. Um, again, it it's it isn't it isn't what you think. I mean, typical paddlers are digging hard to get that kayak into the wave, and he wasn't doing any of that. None of that. He's just hanging on. And uh, and and I think that that was a winning strategy. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, if you get thrown off the horse, just grab the horse and hang on. And eventually you can climb back on the horse and keep riding. And that's exactly what he did. So um, it would be great to see more Thule watercraft out and about on the river, um, well, certainly I, as an experimental process. I, I've, uh, I'm on a, I, I got a, another trip this year. I'm, I'm, I grew up in Tuba City and I'm, I'm trying to do as many, I, I had no idea how to get on these trips until I reconnected with Tom a few years ago and and he invited me to my first one and um so I, i'm trying to do you can only do one trip per year and I, i've gotten invited on a on one we're launching december 4th this year 
and my wife was coming along on this trip and and i i tried to convince her maybe a two-person tule craft she wasn't buying it so i'm i'm gonna roll a regular boat this time so you know i you should build one i bet you find somebody to jump in the back seat <laughs> I bet I could on this trip for sure. Oh, fantastic. Uh, any other questions? That was a fantastic presentation, guys. Oh, this, is, this is Bill. Um, Peter, did, uh, uh, the boat does look unwieldy, and it was mighty bold of you to take that on. Did you manage to come through uh, any of the significant rapids upright, or did you just basically assume you were going to crash and burn at some point and then hang on? Oh no, no, I, I went through a lot of them upright for sure. Uh, if you if you Google a Hermit Rapid turn Tule Reed, you'll see I went through the whole thing, just no problem at all. And Hermit, if anybody, if that's the most fun rapid in the canyon anyway, because it it doesn't have any big waves. And actually, it wasn't so much the rapids that would get me off quite often. It was more the eddies. It sort of you know at the tail end of all of the rapids are these little swirlies and eddies and stuff. And I would, you know, be trying to figure out which way I need to go on those. And all of a sudden it would just catch me and then turn me over. And um, <laughs> that was, that was the harder part. So, yeah. Well, well done. That was fantastic. <laughs> and, and Phil, it just, they let you know, it was really nice to have Fiona around because several times, you know, she'd come up behind me and, um, and also it was really nice to follow her uh, quite often. Like, like I say, on that uh, hands one, I was going f forward. I should have had her going before me because I, I was in front of her and she should have been leading. I would have gotten in the right spot, I imagine. Yeah, she said she got worried about you on the approach to Hans, but um, she had a blast <laughs> uh, doing the river with you. Uh, she was good company. Well, thank you so much, Peter and Tom. Um, like I said, if you missed any part of the presentation today, that will be up on our, our website in a couple of weeks. And uh, please go to Vishnu Temple Press and buy your new favorite Grand Canyon book, plus you're supporting uh, Reardon Mansion State Historic Park. And go to our website for um, updates and upcoming events. So take good care, everyone, and uh, thank you all so much. Bye-bye. And thank you again, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.